Okay. Hello, my name is Kerry, and I'm going to be talking about uh, different types of lawn sword uh, trainers, weapon simulators that are used in historical European martial arts, also abbreviated as HEMA, sometimes referred to as Western martial arts or WMA, things like that. So, um, I've got here a variety of different types of weapon trainers, synthetic and steel, that cover three main categories. At least I refer to them as three main categories. There's differing people uh, viewpoints within the HEMA uh, worldwide sports kind of emerging right now. So some definitions aren't super defined. This is just what I kind of use for my, uh, my own navigation on the different types of products that are available for people that are catered and you know, manufactured for people that practice HEMA. The first category is uh, the first tier of, of product, of, of training equipment. That would be starter equipment, the, the beginner equipment. It's also frequently used as loaning equipment by clubs, purchased in bulk, and allowed uh, students to be able to use that so they don't have to make the financial investment into their own kit just to have practice lessons. So that would be something represented by, um, let's see, I think it might be uh, uh, one of these synthetic swords. It could be one of these, which is produced by, I believe this is a Rawling. I think Red Dragon also manufactures them now. Okay. And uh, another type would be this synthetic, which is from Black Fencer and is somewhat comparable to the synthetics that Purple Heart Armory also produces here in the States. Okay. And uh, another category of starter equipment over here would be the Red Dragon uh, Concept Fetter, uh, feeder, I should say, it's a German word. This is not manufactured anymore, and we'll talk more about this, but this would be an example of the type of, of stuff that are in the first tier. An important characteristic of the first tier gear, the loaner gear, it has to be suitable for light to medium intensity level of drilling. And to some extent, free play, uh, sparring, if you will, with the sword being able to engage and fight people uh, with it, and for the weapon to not break, and uh, uh, ideally not seriously harm your uh, friend. We'll talk more about that. Um, second tier would be equipment such as this uh, Fabry or Morum produced uh, feeder short. Uh, it's a German word for feather sword, basically. I think I'm pronouncing it correctly. It's often abbreviated as just a feeder. Uh, I think to make us easier for us Americans to talk about it. This would be considered a second tier, I believe. It is suitable for light up to, uh, I would say, intense levels of sparring. It has a suitable flex, so when you thrust in their person, it doesn't hurt them, or ideally it doesn't kill them, I should really say. It's designed to work in cooperation with training uh, protective equipment such as our jackets so that you can thrust in their person and it won't you know, really seriously maim them, which is different than some of the, uh, the first tier gear that we'll talk about uh, in a bit. This uh, would also be um, suitable for someone to use for a tournament setting as well. Now, the third class of gear would be something like this uh, Oris. Uh, I believe it's pronounced Oris. It's a, uh, I think that they are. This would be considered a tournament uh, grade weapon. It has a very suitable flex to it, but it's been designed uh, by, by the way that the fuller is created. It creates sort of this I-beam sort of look to it. It gives it a lot of great uh, strength for very intense levels of sparring. And it's something that People will also use as a trainer, but I purchased it so that uh, I can do very intense levels of uh, fighting with this, and it probably won't break. Whereas some of the other trainers that I use for you know my more day-to-day -day types of practice sessions, I would use that instead because I, I don't want this to you know, somehow break outside of you know some the, the proper setting, basically. So the the important thing is that many types of trainers. They can break over time as you use them. It's a metal object that's constantly being you know, smashed against another metal object, coming at it with high force. 
they will eventually break under intense levels of stress. So you can really extend the lifespan of your training uh, weapon if you only use certain weapons for intense levels of sparring and then you use other weapons for more light to you know medium levels of drilling and sparring sessions in your practice sessions. That's the philosophy behind having multiple types of weapons. Of course, it's not the reason why I've purchased multiple types of weapons. I've purchased multiple types of weapons because they all have unique qualities to them and I really wanted to get a real good understanding of what is available in the market, what the different uh, qualities are. There are some things about different weapons that are more useful for certain styles of lawn search fencing, if you will, and we'll talk about that in this video as well. So starting from the, the bottom of the ladder, the first tier of stuff, the stuff for the starters, for beginners, and is also suitable as learning gear, we're going to go over very briefly what is often used by many different clubs. Uh, and some clubs, it's unique to just them, but overall, the, uh, the entire landscape of HEMA, basically, okay? So the very first thing you've got is a stick, okay? I don't have a stick out here, but you know what a stick is, right? Like, a lot of people, they will start with using uh, wooden wasters, a stick, something like that. Maybe it's a, a kendo shinai. Maybe it is a boken, even, something that's more prominently used in the keto. The issue with these wooden wasters is that, you know, they don't bend. So you compare it to a synthetic, compare it to a synthetic uh, waster, if you will, and these ones will bend and flex in the thrust, just like a steel feeder will, which makes them much more useful than the uh, the wooden weapons. Also, these have been designed to really emulate many of the properties of a sword. So it has a cross guard, it has a pommel, it has a suitably shaped handle which is not really rectangular. We'll talk about that in a bit with, when it comes to certain, uh, certain models of uh, practice swords. It has what's more defined as an oval-shaped handle, which narrows as it gets closer down to the pommel. And that makes it easier for you to do certain types of techniques, such as if you're crossed in the bind, you come around, you go like this as a person. It just makes that easier for the sword to operate as a lever in that way. But this is the first type of, of, of training tool some people will use. Some schools will use the sticks to start out because it's very cheap and it's very affordable. Uh, some of them will even, because they come from a LARPing background, live action role playing, they'll start using these uh, type of foam simulator swords. And these can be, you know, they have their use. This particular type one, it does have a type of foam, which is non-latex. I can't remember what it's called. But when it comes across another weapon of that type of foam, it can kind of simulate the sharp edge of a sword, which will bite into the edge of another sword when they go edge to edge in alignment. It somewhat simulates those properties. However, it is definitely much lighter. You know, it's, it's way lighter than uh, a real sword would be. Another problem is that it really can't bend. It cannot bend properly. And the reason is because what is stabilizing this blade is a very, um, a very rigid, very light piece of PVC tubing. The same type of tubing that would be used to construct a kite, you know, like Charlie Brown, you got a kite up in the air. It's basically a kite pipe, and it doesn't bend very easily. So you can't really simulate thrusting very well with these types of weapons. They also lack the proper weight distribution, point of balance and other properties that a real sword would have. So it's very important that when you are studying historical European martial arts, you are using a weapon that has the correct properties for the martial art weapon that you are trying to study. Otherwise, the techniques really won't work very well for you if they don't have the correct properties. So it's very important to have a simulator that simulates these properties very well, and this really does it. This is, I think, mostly just suitable for people who are training children very young children who just don't have, they lack the strength to um, to hold something like even uh, the, the Rawlings synthetic fetter. For very young children, this, this type of, maybe not this lawn of the blade, but you get the point. This might be more suitable for them. Um, getting, uh, I mentioned maybe that this is manufactured by a company called 
uh, Kalamazoo, based out of Canada, and uh, they make a lot of high-end uh, LARPing uh, boffers, if you will. Okay, so going up for the next tier, I would say the Rollins. The Rollins would be the next tier in terms of affordability. Another valuable thing about uh, the Rawlings, which is also manufactured by Red Dragon now, I think. So sometimes they're labeled as Red Dragon synthetics. Uh, there are a line, I think it's called um, Pro X line or, or Pro Extreme or something like that. Um, you can remove the the, uh, the the furnishings of the weapon. You can remove the handle, remove the cross guard, put other ones on there. And this allows you to put different blades on as well. They have a, a wide variety. So they have uh, arming uh, arming blade or, or knightly blade style one-handed swords. They have uh, slightly larger uh, blades than this. I think it's the hand and a half. Uh, they have uh, blades that uh, are for falchions and sabers and uh, uh, messers and other types of weapons. So by purchasing a bunch of these in bulk, you can mix and match them, have different colors. These are very popular uh, starting equipment for some clubs because they're fairly affordable to purchase. They're, you can buy one of these for under a hundred bucks. Because it is made of a synthetic material, it somewhat grips against another synthetic sword blade of the same type of material a little bit, but not really a lot. It's, and uh, in terms of weight, it kind of feels like a sword, but not really. But you know, you can still do a lot of the same techniques. So you can do the same techniques but it doesn't have precisely the same properties because the weight is a little bit off, it's lighter. These are of course suitable for children to be able to practice, if I would say that they're around uh, at least 10 years old, I suppose. These are light enough that they can use. They don't need too much equipment. They basically just need to have a fencing mask, fencing helmet on, maybe also have some gloves for hand protection. Uh, Red Dragon, of course, manufactures hand protection but it's basically just uh, lacrosse gloves. So if you have some child-sized lacrosse gloves, you can use these to train children. That's important to know. Next category up from the Rawlings would be the Black Fencer Synthetics. And much uh, similar to the Rawlings, these can come uh, sort of bind against each other if they have uh, a type of, I can't remember what they call it, but it's like a, a little burring that they put on the edges. It makes it just a little bit easier for them to stick against each other when you're in the crossings. So it somewhat simulates a sword a little bit better than the rolling does in that aspect. Unfortunately, it has very little flex to it. So it's, uh, and for the thrust, it's just not as good of a simulator. They are very affordable, of course. They, they come with, um, I mean, they're, they're just, you know, beaters. They're, they're made to be able to whack somebody and for the thing to not break, basically. And uh, uh, there's some negative aspects to them. The, the cord wrapping that's on them, it's, uh, it's basically just uh, a, a very cheap cord that's been dipped entirely in glue and then wrapped around the handle. So if you actually try to, without this, uh, this, this uh, tennis grip, uh, tennis racket grip that I've put on it, if you were to hold it, you might actually cut your hands if you're you know, doing any type of uh, drilling with any intensity because it's just so hard. It's like, a, it's like holding a, a brick, basically. So what you want is to definitely rewrap it. I think that tennis cord grip is the best. It's the cheapest. It feels the best. It's the easiest to put on there. Some people will use hockey grip and things like that. But I just think this is a lot better. A company named Purple Heart Armory also sells a very similar type. And this is from Black Fencer, which is based out of uh, Europe, so there's an import fee associated with bringing this into the United States. So you might just go with the Purple Hearts instead. Totally up to you if this is what you're interested in getting. They are a little bit more expensive than the Rawlings, though. All right, the next category up from the synthetics would be your very early first tier steel uh, trainers. Now this is the Red Dragon concept from the, the version two line. I believe it was called modular, uh, although I don't have any of the modular parts for it. It is a very inexpensively produced uh, feeder. It has a sh what's called a schilt. Uh, it's basically German for shield. 
And the purpose of this is so that when another plane comes at you, it catches it here so that it doesn't hit your hands. That's the idea behind it. And what's the historical significance of that? Well, shilts came about during the Renaissance when swordsmanship started to get practiced by the non-noble class. It was practiced by uh, merchants and tradesmen as a way of having a sport, you know, maybe for possibly uh, preparing for military activities if they had to uh, protect the city and so forth. So because a lot of these tradesmen, they're, you know, having to practice, but they also need to work with their hands. If they break their hands, you know, they may not be able to work for a while until their hand, you know, repairs itself. So they started adding these shilts into their training swords so that they would give them a little bit more extra protection uh, so that they would reduce the chance of breaking their hand. That's what the purpose of this is. So this style of shilt, because there are many different types of shilts, this is considered to be a crown uh, style because it has you know, sort of like a crown look to it. There's other types of shilts as well as I show on this one. This is more of a boxy type of shilt and it's more preferred for most people because this type can sometimes uh, be a bit of a, um, you know, a, a danger to yourself, if you will. Nonetheless, for light to medium level uh, intensity of drilling and freestyle uh, sparring, free play, this is totally suitable. Now you'll hear maybe on video this is rattling a little bit. It's because, uh, because it was a new manufacturer, nobody had any reviews about it or anything like that. I wanted to see how durable the dang thing was, so I took it and I literally smashed it against some metal fencing pipe in a backyard and then smashed it against a tree just to see if it would hold up. And it definitely holds up. It's definitely, um, I think it's well produced for a beginner starter weapon. There are some aspects to it that are obviously lacking. Um, the handle material is made of the same type of synthetic leather that you see in, um, let's say, uh, Ronin Katana produced Euro Series sharp swords and Hanway swords and things like that. It tends to wear out very quickly, but of course you can just rewrap this thing in uh, tennis grip if you needed to. The, uh, the hilting obviously comes loose very easily, um, but the pommel feels like it should have been just a little bit more weighted, I think, this, uh, this type of pommel being the pear, smooth pear shaped pommel. Uh, but it's totally suitable for you know, a beginner to use as loading equipment. So if you see some of these like on eBay or something, or somebody's uh, selling used equipment, you know, I would say go ahead and pick it up because it can be very suitable for a beginner. Now, this is unique, I think, in a lot of different, I mean, you don't really see this very often in, in uh, feeders. The way that the blade narrows as it gets closer toward the tip. I assume this has been designed to make it a little bit easier to manufacture at a more affordable price compared to something like, say, uh, the Oris Alexander III here. Um, and that does, of course, reduce its you know level of durability. But if you're not going to go intense sparring against somebody, you know, if you really go to town, it's probably going to last you know many many years, I would think. Um, the construction has what's called a button tip. You can see that here uh, on camera. It's a button tip compared to a roll tip. So you can see the difference, I think. Hopefully you can see this on camera. This uh, Regane has a rolled tip, and this is more of a button tip. Uh, it's just the way that it's been forged. There's different people that have different preferences. The preference of the rolled tip is that it's a little bit cheaper to make, um, supposedly, and is less likely to ever be able to penetrate through your equipment. Of course, it does have that hook on the end, so that hook can actually uh, attach on your equipment, possibly rip your equipment. And with the buttons, you have less chance of that ever happening. Um, the buttons, I think, are generally a superior type of tip ending, but a lot of it's kind of pointless because we tend to put uh, arrow blunts or the the foot ends of chairs uh, the rubber uh, the rubber bunting basically of chair onto our sword so that they have less chance of ever penetrating through our gear we'll talk about that more in a bit 
One thing I want to note is that the type of construction for this blade is very similar to the way that a main gauge is uh, manufactured. In this case, this is my uh, main gauge for my rapier kit produced by uh, Castile Armory out of Oregon, USA. Uh, it's very similar. I don't know if it's coming across on video very well, but it's a very similar blade type of shape. It's just a lot larger. So I think that it's quite durable for its intended purpose, which is not tournament level play, not for intense levels of sparring, although I did you know, definitely give it a lot of really intense hard wax, trying to break it against a metal stand, a uh, metal fence stand, and against a tree. And it held up. It does have a little bit of rusting on it because I did a bit of a rust test. Let it sort of sit out for a bit in my storage unit just to see how long it would take. I think this has been sitting for an entire year and that's all it looks like. So it's actually, you know, it's, it's pretty, pretty good product for its price point in my opinion. All right, the next tier up would be a VB, which has a rolled tip. This is considered the lawn sword techniques feeder. Uh, feeder. It is uh, sold here in the United States by Purple Heart Armory, but it's manufactured, I think, in Russia, Poland, somewhere around there. It has you know, good properties for being able to uh, do a variety of techniques. But um, there are some things about it that I'm not super happy about. The handles by VB produced weapons, in my viewpoint, are not, um, they're not comfortable to hold with your hand. They tend to be a little bit more rectangular than oval shaped. They tend to uh, just have a little bit of extra grip that's required to hold onto them as a consequence of that. But for their price point, they're fairly good. They, of course, do have a flex, but it's not much of a flex. It's very similar to the properties of a blunt, sharp blade. Um, the blade does feel a little bit heavy. Now, for protective gear in uh, HEMA, many people use these uh, lobster-style uh, heavy gauntlets. They're made out of a uh, hard plastic material, lots of padding and leather. And it's somewhat like a medieval gauntlet. And the important thing about it is that it really extends the size of your hand. So if you try to use a smaller handle sword, like for example, a more uh, historically accurate sized handle for doing really intense, it, it can kind of sort of interfere with techniques just a little bit and a lot of people don't like that. So what you end up having is uh, a less historically accurate handle length and size compared to some of the other stuff that you start to see in, in at least this tier with the VB swords, lawn swords, where the handle has been extended so that it's a little bit easier to uh, fight and do various types of, of techniques and things like that while you are wearing these heavy gauntlets. And that's an important characteristic to consider when you're choosing what type of sword to purchase. Does it have a handle that is long enough for the protective equipment that you're gonna be using to cover your hands? That's something that you should consider. Um, but this is totally as suitable as a, uh, a loaner equipment, as a first starter equipment sword as well for a student. It just has, you know, some, there's some short, shortcuts, I would say, uh, that were in the manufacturing process, largely in the handle, its lack of flex, the rolled tip, and just being a little bit blade heavy. I don't recall what the point of balance is on this, but it's probably uh, just a little, maybe a little blade heavy. Now this is a Hanway Tinker Lawn Sword. Um, obviously this is a sharp blade, but there is a blunt version that is made that has very similar properties. Normally they cap the end of it and went for those schools that currently still use them as uh, trainers. Now, similar to the VB, it has a very rectangular shaped handle. Of course it does narrow down here, but just gripping it, it's not super comfortable and uh, it takes a little bit more hand strength to hold on to it as a consequence of that. 
I mean, we're talking about slight differences, but these slight differences start adding up as you are practicing for an hour plus of time. The uh, weight of it feels a bit off because although it has a pommel, it's a fishtail flat pommel, it just doesn't seem like it's counterbalancing it as much as I think it should. So um, the blade is very light, however, so it's a very subtle difference and it doesn't really uh, influence um, your ability, like it's not going to tire out your arm or anything. It's a very light weapon, but because the blades are super thin, because it primarily was designed for cutting, it tends to be, I think, a bit more fragile than your average type of training weapon which has been produced now. This is a very older style of model. It was first created in, I think, the early 2000s, these type of swords. So it's changed a lot, the, the style and the improvements in the manufacturing process for the development of training lawn swords. I wouldn't recommend people uh, purchase the blunt tinker lawn swords for use as training, uh, but some people do use them. And uh, it is a little bit more expensive, I think, to do these than it is to do just you know buying uh, any other, other type of level, the tier one starter equipment trainers. But if it's something that you want to have, something that feels like your Tinker Lawn Sword that you use for cutting practice, then you could totally use this as well. Okay, let's get into our tier two swords. This is a, I believe his name is pronounced Regine. He is a European Smith. Uh, there are, of course, uh, companies, I think Hema Supplies, that uh, imports them and sells them here in the United States. I purchased this, uh, I think maybe uh, two years ago or something like that. I use this um, quite a bit because it's the short model of feeder. It's designed for people that are a bit shorter, and I am a bit shorter. It has suitable flex uh, for being able to do thrustings very safely has a rolled tip of course which I would blunt normally but I took a blunt off to put it on a different weapon I stopped using this one it has a box style of shilt on it I, at least I refer to this as sort of a box shape which makes it a little bit more safer for doing uh, grappling work close uh, throws and things like that while you are fencing it feels very light and uh, part of the reason of course because it's a very narrow uh, bar basically so it doesn't have a lot of heft to the blade but it is fairly durable um, it does have a point of balance I think which is a little bit closer toward the cross guard than you would see in a historical sword I have some notes here from my notes the blade length is 96 centimeters um, the cross guard is made of steel and the crossbar is 75 centimeters across. The handle itself is 29 centimeters, so it has the extended handle for being able to fight with uh, spez heavy gauntlets. Uh, the point of balance is 8 centimeters from the guard, and it weighs about 3 pounds. It's a very. It's a very uh, much a workhorse. It's totally suitable for light to. Um, I would even say intense levels of sparring. Um, I'm not sure if I would necessarily want to use this for a tournament where some people really are giving it their all, uh, or at least a, 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 even, I'm not necessarily meaning like a big, huge tournament, even just your school's tournament sometimes. You know, there's people that really, you know, they're trying to like uh, invoke, you know, the will of Odin or something, act like a berserker or whatever. I don't know if I would want to use this for that type of opponent, but it's totally good as a second tier. This is something that can last many, many years if you practice correctly with your sword. And uh, I think it's a good one, especially if you're a shorter like me. I use this quite a bit and uh, I don't have any, any complaints about it. Okay, also in the second tier is a Italian scrimiator. I believe is how it's meant to be pronounced. It's produced by a Smith here in the United States. Uh, dark wood armory and uh, I like it a lot. It does have a flex to it much like a fetter wood But it is shaped a little bit more similarly to a blunt It has some similar properties to one of the Oruses in the sense that it has a very eye beam uh, fuller 
that's in the blade that gives it you know a good structural strength for um, for for I would even say intense levels of sparring. There's people that use these for many many years at certain clubs, and uh, it's just a really good workhorse. My model has a fishtail pommel. It's very smooth. Uh, the handle, of course, is shorter. It's more meant to simulate a real sword, so it doesn't have the extended uh, handle like many trainers do. The attachment is done with a nut, so it's very easy to retighten this. Now, it does not have a longer handle, so it's really meant to be a very accurate trainer for the historical type of swords that were being used back in this time period. Some people don't like it because it doesn't have that extended handle. But if you're really wanting to uh, practice, you know, something that's very historically accurate, um, this is the type of weapon that you would be using. That's why some people prefer to use uh, this type of training tool instead of something more like a feeder. Although this does have, you know, as I said before, some properties similar to a feeder in the sense that it, you know, it bends very well. It does have the thickening of the uh, the, the, the edges here, the I beam shape with the fuller which makes it have a little more structural integrity, being able to hold up to good levels of sparring. It also uh, kind of has this Colomanche type of blade where it sort of, uh, the, the, uh, the blade narrows a little bit as it gets toward the tip. And it has this almost shilt-like sort of uh, bump to it really where the strong of the blade is. So. Uh, I really like this. This has become my primary trainer. Here I have it blunted with uh, a blunt here. This is a common type of blunt. This is what I used to have on my Regine, and I put it now uh, onto this uh, Darkwood Italian Scrimiator uh, trainer, commonly used by people that study Armazari in the Pacific Northwest. It's also very popular amongst uh, the SCA, Society for Creative Anarchism. I believe it's used by people I know that Dark Armory has a stand at Penzik uh, often, and they sell these. Now this is also a second tier sword produced by Fabrio Morum. I believe they're out of the Czech Republic. And uh, it's very much a hefty type of feeder. Although it doesn't have the lengthening of the I-beam uh, edges here, uh, it does have a lot of strength to it. It's made out of a spring steel. And um, I can't remember off the top of my head what um, Type it is. It's a European one that's used in machinery, and uh, it's a very strong sword. It also has a cross guard that has these rounded finales on it, and I think that's a very good safety uh, mechanism. You see some of these types of uh, cross guards, which basically are just, you know, a, a very slight rounding of the finale on the cross guard tip, and it can be a little bit dangerous. This is a lot less dangerous, in my opinion. The handle, of course, is very long. It's been lengthened so that you can uh, use it with spez heavies. The pommel is, I would call this to be ball-shaped pommel. Very popular type of pommel used in lawn swords of the period. It has the box type of shilt, which is the more safer type. This is very much a durable weapon. It is a little bit heavier than your average feeder is. I think it's because of the point of balance is a little bit further, it's more historically accurate in that regard. There are many feeders which have the point of balance closer to the cross guard so that when you're in the bind you want to go and do something like that, it's a lot easier to do that. But you know, you don't, wanna, you don't have to have it. It's just something that people like to have on it. Your mileage can vary according to your style. I prefer something that feels a little bit more like an actual sword so that when uh, I'm training, I know that the techniques that I'm doing are being done correctly the way that they're intended to be because real swords would have a little bit more of the balance toward the hand, uh, toward the tip so that when you are cutting it makes it a lot easier for you to be able to do the cutting techniques when the cross of uh, the point of balance is more toward the handle it becomes less efficient for cutting but you know for purposes of the sport of hema lawn sword having it closer toward the cross guard can make it easier for you to do many of the German school Meyer techniques. I think it's totally suitable. It has a nice leather wrapped handle and uh, it's a very good uh, oval shaped handle. It feels comfortable in the hand and uh, I, this is probably 
I would say one of the third most used uh, feeders that I have used while I've been studying. You could tell that I kind of left it sitting in storage for a bit. It's got a little bit of rust on it as a result. I don't think I've used this in about a year. So that actually doesn't look too bad, all considering. I just need to uh, grind it down a little bit and uh, look good as new. Now finally, we get to the third tier. This is a, I think I'm pronouncing it correctly, an Aureus uh, Alexander III model. It is one of the more expensive uh, feeders on the market made out of Europe. I think that they're in Russia or Poland, Ukraine, somewhere in there. Um, it's really, really nice. It has that I-beam type of fuller and the extended edges so that when you go to smash against somebody else's feeder, your blade is likely not to break. It has a very small uh, shilt underneath the rain cap. That's what this is called, a rain cap. Um, and most historical swords would have it. People call it a rain cap because the assumption was that it protects your blade scabbard uh, from the rain when it's in there. That's not what it's for. It's for when you do a thumb grip, you actually have something to hold on to. That's the purpose of it. It does have an extended handle, and this type of handle uh, does have, of course, the oval shape that you want in your lead hand and narrows down, but this is considered to be more of a diamond-shaped handle, which is more historically accurate for the time period uh, of lawn swords were being used in, in the Renaissance. It makes it a little bit easier for you to, to use it as a lever when it has that length. Of course, this is a very extreme example. This is something you would normally see a type of handle on a great sword and not a necessarily a long sword. Great sword being something like a Montati um, or a, a Zui Hander, a Claymore, whatever you want to call it. Um, the type of pommel that is on this, the pommels can be changed. This is more of a, uh, a hexagonal type of up here, hair pommel, and I think it just makes it a little bit easier to hold on to it when you're wearing those Spez heavies because it has that rectangular type of grip that you can have as opposed to the smooth. That's just made my preference. Now, of course, there are people that have different opinions on whether you should be holding the pommel or not. I am from the school of thought where you do hold the pommel. It is part of the sword and um, some people don't, they want to hold it here. That's totally fine. They want to do that and, and, and cut less effectively. That's their business. But because it has the long extended handle, when they're wearing the Spez Heavy gauntlets, they can do that and they can um, fence that way. But me personally, I like the, uh, the having a little bit more grip to the pommel so that I make sure that I have proper edge alignment when I am cutting. Um, it is very durable. Is very flexible. There are some Oruses that do not have a flexibility to them and uh, they're not accepted in tournaments. This one has suitable flexibility so it can be used for a tournament. And of course it has a button type of uh, tip on it which is very safe and unlikely to uh, cause serious harm to your opponent as long as they're wearing suitable equipment. I very much like this one for the tournament usage. That's what I intend to use it for. It definitely could hold up to intense whacking and sparring and basically take almost no damage whatsoever. It's uh, a really nice one. Now, in terms of blade length, uh, I, this is something that's important to consider. Now, uh, blade lengths that are really meant for certain types of people. As you can see, compared to the Italian Scrimator, this blade is a little bit longer than that one, but then it has this much longer handle as well. And that can somewhat impact your ability to do certain types of techniques, such as uh, in Armazari where you're doing certain grapplings or you're throwing somebody. The extended handle can kind of get in the way. Now, um, if you're contrasting Fiori's sword to, let's say, Body's sword, which is part of the Armazari family, this does basically go up to my armpits, so it's appropriate for my height. Uh, body would agree. Uh, Fiori doesn't really give measurements, but he's definitely using a shorter sword, so maybe Fiori disagrees. This is why it's nice to have different types of swords for different types of purposes that have different lengths and characteristics to them. You can get a sense of how different uh, techniques are performed when you have a different type of weapon, size, and, and 
and handle size and things of what and how the technique has to be adjusted uh, for uh, the differing characteristics of the weapon that you are using. I think that's an important, uh, really cool aspect of historical fencing. So there's, you know, if you're also of the same mind, you want to get a real good sense of what it was like way back in the day, as close as we possibly can to the present day. It's nice to have different types of arms that have different characteristics that you might have for different purposes so you can get, you know, a, a, a sense of what it would have been like because there was a wide variety of different types of swords with different uh, characteristics, some of which have survived the present day, some of which we only know about in like paintings and drawings and things. So, just one of the cool aspects of exploring historical fencing that I think of. Another thing to consider about the size of blades is that uh, in terms of the length, the Italian scrimator I have here and the Regine are the short, the Regine short, are pretty much identical blade lengths. So even though this one has a longer handle, when I put it out in front of me, I basically have the exact same length. So even if I'm trained with this, the techniques that I'm practicing with this would basically almost be identical to the techniques with this, simply because the blade, I'm not getting any type of reach advantage here. But the longer handle, as said before, it can somewhat get in the way when you're doing uh, close range fighting. You might whack yourself in the head with your own pommel, which you don't really want to do. And uh, it's just something to consider here. So when you're choosing your practice weapon, these are some of the things to think about. I hadn't really seen a video on YouTube where somebody takes a bunch of different practice lawn swords and compares them to each other and explains different uh, their perspective on it. Maybe more people can do that, I don't know. Maybe I'm just some weirdo who owns a whole bunch of fucking different feeders from different makers and not, not a lot of other people do that. But uh, this is the video. Let me know in the comments what you guys think, any questions you have. Happy to uh, answer some questions. See you in the next one, cheers.